Good morning and welcome everybody. Come and take a seat as we start our service this morning. So good, warm welcome and good morning to everyone this morning. Welcome to St. Basil's Artaman Anglican Church. My name's Ken. Welcome for those who are with us week in, week out, and uh, welcome to those who's their first time with us today. Thanks for joining us for our 9.30 a.m. English service. And uh, this morning there, as we reflect on um, what's been happening over the last 24 hours there, we still see sin and suffering alive and well, well in this world, uh, in events even here in Sydney and then around the world. But uh, it's great that we can come together uh, once a week there here on a Sunday, that we as Christians can come together to worship our great God, that even in the midst of sin and suffering, that we know that he is in control. He's the one who created everything, the one at the very beginning who by his word created all things. He's a holy, righteous and just God. He will come to judge all sin. Yet at the same time, he is also loving, gracious and compassionate. He has given a way for us to turn back to him. In our service today, uh, we'll start by singing two songs. We'll open up the Bible together, uh, which is God's word. And we'll read from the second chapter of the book of Joel. We'll have uh, David, our senior minister, come to preach from us to, to us from this, this passage. We'll also have a time to reflect and repent and read together as a church a confession before we have a prayer on behalf of the congregation. We'll also sing a final song together, thanking God for his grace shown to us, and we'll have a few church announcements before closing the service in prayer. But I uh, invite everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads as I pray to open the service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that, um, that you, the creator of the universe, have given us a way to call you Abba, to call you Father. Lord, we continue to look on our, our world and see all the sin suffering and damage that we do to one another and we see the hopelessness in it but lord we also see you and see the hope that you give through your son jesus christ lord we pray today as we're here to hear that we can listen and that your holy spirit change our hearts by your word in jesus name we pray Amen. I invite uh, Jen and also Amy and Rachel to lead us in song. Please stand.
This next song, Refiner's Fire, was released in 1990 and its lyrics hold deep meaning and a profound reflection on our relationship with God. The song's, song's inspiration is based on the biblical concept of God's refining fire. The Bible teaches that God uses the trials and challenges of life to refine us and purify our hearts. The song's lyrics are a reminder that the process of refining and purifying is not easy. It involves going through the trials and challenges of life. However, God uses these trials to refine and change us. Now, now time to read the Bible there. So if you've got a Bible in front of you or if you can uh, reach over to one of the, um, the church pew Bibles there, I ask you to turn to Joel chapter 2 and I'll be reading verses 1 to 27. It's on page 634 of the, the Brown Church Bibles. So Joel chapter 2 verses 1 to 27. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. 
a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. Before them, fire devours. Behind them, a flame blazes. Before them, the land is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them, a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses. They gallop along like cavalry. With the noise that like of chariots, they leap over the mountain tops, like a crackling fire consuming stubble, like a ma mighty army drawn up for battle. At the sight of them, the nations are in anguish. Every face turns pale. They charge like warriors. They scale war like soldiers. They all march in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other. Each marches straight ahead. They plunge through defences without breaking ranks. They rush upon the city. They run along the wall. They climb into houses. Like thieves, they enter through the windows. Before them, the earth shakes, the heavens tremble. The sun and moon are darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders ahead at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number and mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows, he may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, Gather the people, consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I'm sending you grain, new wine and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern horde far from you, pushing it into a parched and barren land its eastern ranks will drown in the Dead Sea and its western ranks in the Mediterranean Sea and its stench will go up, its, smile, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to see people at church. Uh, my name is David. I'm the minister here. Uh, it's quite a tragic event that happened in Bonai Junction um, uh, yesterday afternoon. I think this is right. Um, we pray, uh, pray to God for the loss of life, uh, for comfort, uh, and, and help us understand what's going on. Let, let me pray. Sovereign Lord and loving Heavenly Father, who grieved the loss of life through the acts of violence in our city. Please comfort all those who grieve or have been impacted by these events. We thank you for the police, ambulance, and emergency medicine personnel who are first responders to these events. We pray for the recovery of those who have been injured and those who continue to be distressed by these traumatic circumstances. Father, we are confused and distressed by violent and senseless acts in our city. We cast our anxieties on you, knowing that you care for us. Please turn our hearts to your Son, that we may find our rest in him, and hasten the day when peace and justice reign. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. We're going to look at uh, the book of Joel, which we started last week. Many of us, we don't like to talk about the judgment of God. We think that it's too negative. It's too depressing. It dampens the mood in church. And we usually want something that's positive. We want to be positive, happy people. We want to talk about the love of God. The love of God is far more appealing to our generations. Recently, in a Super Bowl, if you watch a Super Bowl, the sort of biggest prime time TV, where I was told like 30 second ad will cost you something like $10 million, some Christians in America actually put an ad. Uh, I'm going to put it on to see what it is. The ad's called He Gets Us. He Gets Us. It's a powerful ad, isn't it? Uh, you see all sorts of people sort of washing each other's feet. You see the priest washing the feet of the prostitute. The mach macho man washing the feet of a transgender person. And the message in the end is, well, he gets us. He gets us. It's a powerful message. And the message is Jesus really understands us. He accepts us who we are. And it loves us. While it's a true message, the question is, is that a total message? As we read the pages of the Bible, well, there's so much about the judgment of God. I remember last year as we preached through the book of uh, Amos, uh, it was just judgment after judgment after judgment. In fact, it was so relentless, it was just negative messages after negative messages. Uh, Joe, even after one Sunday, he came back to me and goes, well, the sermons, well, they're all too depressing, aren't they? As we read through the book of Joel, well, the first two chapters, unfortunately, is also about the judgment of God. The judgment of God, it came through the locust plague. Yes, God is about love, but God's also about his righteousness, his justice, his faithfulness, and his anger. See, God's anger and God's love, they are not incompatible. In fact, God's anger and God's love 
a lot of time it's a two sides of the same coin. God is angry because he loves. So you only get angry with someone you care so much about. Most of us get offended when, uh, get angry when someone offended us. That's because a lot of time we love ourselves so much. Anger and love a lot of time while well, it's the two sides of the same coin. Sometimes we get angry when someone said something negative about someone we love. I'm not sure if you remember a few years ago, we're in a bigger stage, the Oscars, the Academy Awards. Will Smith slapped Chris Rock in the face because Chris Rock had made a joke about his wife. Yes, he should not have lashed out, but you can understand him a bit, can't you? He was angry because he loved his wife. God's angry because he loves this world so much. He cannot stand how we are hurting each other. He's angry that we have destroyed our relationships with each other. He's angry that we destroyed our families. He's angry that we destroyed our society. He was full of wrath because we have ignored his good rules for our lives. See, God's angry because he loves. Anger and love is the two sides of the same coin. We read last week about a locust plague that devastated the country. And Joel, last week, saw, saw in this locust plague the judgment of God. As we come to chapter 2, the locust plague is harbinger of the day of the Lord. The locust plague is the beginning of the day of the Lord. Yes, God's final and decisive judgment has not yet come, but the preliminaries have started. This was the entree. This was the first part of the symphony. This was the prelude. It's just a bit like the thunderstorm. He asks a question, is it what, when does the thunderstorm start? Is it when the clouds move across the sky and darken the sky? Is it when you feel the first raindrop? Is it when you hear the first, see the first lightning flashes across the sky? Is it the first thunder? See, it's hard to define, isn't it, when a thunderstorm starts, because it, the whole thing is one and the same event. Over the last few weeks, I think we had a fairly sort of unpredictable weather in Sydney. I remember I was, during the week I was walking a dog, and I saw the sun, the sky darken, and I knew it was going to rain. In fact, I felt a few raindrops. So I rushed back into the house, but the rain did not come. It stopped for a while, and but it came back that very night. It rained and poured, and we felt the full force of the thunder, thunderstorm. See, the question is, when did the thunderstorm start? Is it when it's, the sky darkened? Is it when we feel a few raindrops? Was it when it's pouring down at night? For those in the meteorologist world, it was one and the same system. It was the same load that brought in the thunderstorm. In the same way, the locust plague at that time was the start of the day of the Lord. Yes, it was not the final judgment, but it is one and the same system. Each disaster that happened to us reminds us that the final judgment is coming. Just like every raindrop that I felt was a warning sign that a storm is arriving. The locust plague was a warning sign. It was the first raindrop. And therefore in chapter 2, we read about this day of the Lord. Look at verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. In verse 111, it's described in terms of locust plague. Yet, as you read it, well, it's bigger than a locust plague. And just like a watchman in a town, the command here was to blow the trumpet, sound the alarm. 
Joel must warn his fellow citizens that the day of the Lord is coming. If he did not warn them, well, the blood will be in his hand. He will be responsible for their deaths. Verse 2 described the vision of the day of the Lord. It was darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness spreading across the mountains like dawn. The invading army of locusts was imposing, covering the whole sky, darkened the day. Verse 3 described the effect of the locust plague. It devoured like inferno, burning everything across its path. Even it was a garden of Eden before them. After the locust plague, it would turn into a desert waste. It would totally destroy everything before its path. Furthermore, in verse 7, it read, nothing, nothing escapes them. Cities, walls, defenses would not stop them. They charged like warriors. He scaled walls like soldiers. They plunged through defenses without even breaking, breaking, breaking ranks. They climbed the houses like thieves through the windows. So the image we get here was all imposing, devours everything, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. I remember a few years ago, after the rain, we had a sort of mice plague in Sydney, in New South Wales. And it just saw, saw images on TV where the mice just sort of devoured everything that, uh, uh, in, in the fields. And the farmers tried to kill the mice. You can kill a few. You can feel, kill hundreds. You can feel like thousands. But it kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. In fact, the mice can probably breed more, than, more faster than you can kill. And you could not lock them out of the house. There's no defenses against the mice. They creep into every hole. You look where everywhere there was mice. They were in the kitchen, in the pantry, in the toilets, in the be beds, in every nooks and cranny. The farmers at the time were completely, completely powerless. See, what Joel was describing here was a devastating locust plague. How did the language morph into something more universal? It was the day of the Lord. Look at verse 10. Before them, the earth shakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number. A mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? Both heaven and earth were shaken. The sun and the moves, moon and the stars were darkened. It was the Lord thunders at the head of his army. The locust plague brought in the day of the Lord. The locust plague was a taste of the day of the Lord. It was the first raindrop of the incoming judgment of God. And when that day comes, well, the question is, who can stand it? If the locust plague was so devastating, so terrible, the day of the Lord will be far, far worse. If we think the locust plague was so unbearable, the day of the Lord will be even more so. It will be dreadful. How do we respond? To an incoming day of the Lord. How to respond? In some ways, the only response we can we, we can do is to fear and, and fear and anguish. Verse six. As a sight of them, nations are anguished. Every face turns pale. How could one stand on that day? How would you stand? However, even with the enemies at the gate, as the saying goes, in verse 12, we hear the gracious voice of God. Even now, even at this late stage, even when in this first raindrop, even when you see the dark sky darken and the, the thunderstorm is about to come, even then, even now, the judgment of God has come as a result of our sin. Uh, it's one interesting book that thing that um, uh, 
scholars have noted that the book of Joel, uh, no specific sins were mentioned. Uh, there was no mention about adultery or hatred or murder or killing or like the book of Amos where people were sold into slavery. However, the sins here are not just specific acts that we have done like murder or lying or cheating. Those are what we call the small S sin. The big S sin is our attitude against God. We have lived our lives without God. We just choose to do what we want to do. We pursue the life that suits us. While it might seem so normal for you, that's what everybody does. Well, that is the definition of sin. Is living with myself as a ruler of my life rather than living with God as a ruler. And the small s sins are just symptoms of this big sin, our rejection of God. And in living our lives our own way, well, in the end, friends, we realize that we wreck our lives, our families, and our world. See, many problems in this world is because I just want to do what is best for me. And we just, we just think that's normal. I just want to do what's best for me, for myself, for my family, for my kids. Well, that's sin. God is therefore angry with our sin. He's angry with our self-determination. He's angry with our self-rule. And he's going to judge us for the way we live. But even then, verse 12, the call here was a call to repentance. Look at verse 12 and 13. Verse 12, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. The call here was a call for repentance. Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. See, the call here was for genuine repentance. In the Old Testament, people were often tore off their expensive garments to show their brokenness and contrition. However, after a while, it could just be a motion that we all go through. I tore off my clothes, I put on a new one the next day. The call here was not just tore their garments. The call here was to rend their hearts. What God was looking for was a heartbreak. As Anglicans, we regularly confess our sins. In fact, we do it almost every single week. We do easily admit that we're sinful. But I must admit, half the time, half the time, my heart's not in it. We just mouth those words. We just recite those lines. We can't even mean what we say, but it does not really move us, to, does it, towards repentance. It does not break us for true change. We're not heartbroken. Rend your hearts, God says, not your garments. God was calling for a brokenness in spirit, a breakdown in our pride, a genuine contrition. True repentance bring on sorrow and determined to act differently. I used the example, I think, a few weeks ago, well, the story of uh, the Rosario Butterfield, uh, uh, because I, was reading, I read her uh, um, uh, uh, biography. Uh, the story was she was a lesbian, LGBTI activist, uh, a tenured English professor. She was champion of the LGBTI causes, was invited everywhere in different places to speak uh, uh, about LGBTI causes. When she became Christian, it was not just a new hobby she took on, nor was it just a club that she joined. In her own words, she said, in becoming Christian, I lost everything. She had to give up her friends, her community, her lover, her lifestyle, and even her identity. She said it was a train wreck. 
she described it, she looked in the mirror, she said she was like a vampire because she looked in the mirror, she saw nothing. All who she was, what she, she, she has achieved, her identity was completely lost. She knew she had to lose everything to become a Christian. But friends, that's what true repentance means. In fact, the call for repentance was so urgent, the command in verse 16 was declare holy fast. Call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate an assembly, bring the elders, the children, and those who are even nursing at the breast. This was so urgent that everybody should come and repent before God. This was so urgent that there's no time for breastfeeding. Let, hun- baby, uh, let hungry baby go hunger, hungry. In fact, the bridegroom leave the room and, and, and bride her chamber, come back from the honeymoon, come back from the celebration. This was so urgent. We need to gather and repent and ask God for mercy. What was God's response? Verse 13. The appeal to a God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and bounding in love. And they knew that God would land from sin and calamity. They knew that even the judgment is coming. God's not an ogre. God's not just someone who just wants to punish people for their sins. He acted out of justice. He acted out of love. They knew that God was not an ogre. He did not, they did not presume on his character. He knew God's justice. And he answered in verse 18. Then the Lord was jealous for the land and took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I'm sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, and I will satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. The Lord was, told, was jealous for the land and took pity on his people. In verse 8 and 27, he said he restored what was lost. For the land that was ravaged by the locust plague, God will send them new grain, new wine, olive oil, enough to satisfy them fully. God would drive the locust plague far away from them to the sea, and all the locusts would drown. For the animals, they were groaning and moaning in chapter 1, well, God would provide pastures that are green. And God will provide fruit again from the fruit trees. For the people of Zion, God will send rain in the proper time so they will again be full of grain and new wine and oil. In fact, the words are quite amazing, isn't it? God will repay them for the years the locusts have eaten. Whatever they've lost, God, God's going to bring it all back. There will have plenty to eat. And fully satisfied. God was restored them what was lost. In fact, if you come back next week, read that God's going to do even more than that. We have sin against God. Our sin is not so much we have murdered someone or committed adultery or lied or cheated. Our sin is we have lived our lives without him. We have ignored him as the rule of our lives. We just take it for granted. We just live our lives our own way, the way I want it. And it seems normal. God's angry, rightly angry with our sin. His judgment is coming. It's the day of the Lord. first raindrop has come. However, even in this stage, as the sky darkens, if we rend our hearts and repent, he has promised to forgive and restore us. In the New Testament, we know this because God has sent his own son, Jesus, to die for our sins. We see how it happened. Jesus himself faced the day of the Lord. He faced the judgment of God. Jesus himself suffered the consequences of our sin on the cross. And because of Jesus, 
we can have full, free forgiveness. We have true restoration. We can have real reconciliation with God our Father and with each other. In response to the Super Bowl ad that cost $10 million, some other Christians in America just put on another video, another video that I think just put a few sort of pictures together and same music and everything. I'm going to put it on. So to show, show so this title, He Saves Us, He Saves Us. So they show people drug addicts, KKK member, bikies, LGBTI champion, transgender, pro abortionist Jesus you not know, just gets us. Jesus saves us from the coming wrath. Jesus did not just understand us. He did not just sympathize with us. He saves us from our sin. He saves us from condemnation. God's judgment's coming. But God's salvation, God offer even now true salvation to those who repent and turn to him. If you go on the website, or on the video, YouTube, or on that, so he saves us. What was interesting, what's been freaky, was down the comments, down the bottom. You see comments of people saying, I'm slide number two. I'm slide number four, that was me. I'm slide number six, that was me. Jesus saves us. Let me pray. And if I was looking to spot the Bible, we'll remember that your judgment's coming. But even now, if truly repent, there's true forgiveness and reconciliation through the death of Jesus on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, David, for that message there. But um, it's only right after hearing a message like that um, that we take a f few moments to, in silence to reflect and think for ourselves the ways that we have sinned against God. Let's take a, a few moments of silence to reflect and repent and say sorry to God. Help us to turn to him. But let us join um, after these few minutes of silence to read a, um, a prayer of confession together as a church. But let's take a few moments of silence to, to think. I'll ask everyone to stand with me.
as we um, read the words on the screen together and repent and confess to our Lord God. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. If there are any of you that um, uh, have things that, uh, that you thought of and repented for today but want to speak with someone more about this, please see David and Ned um, after the service. But I'll invite our son now to lead us in a congregational prayer. Please join with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our God, for being our creator and for redeeming us. Thank you for the grace you show us each day and help us to trust in you as a, as a sustainer of all life. As we look, in the news, look on at the news each day and see what happens around the world and what happens here as well, we're reminded of the fragility of life and how little control we really have. We've tried to rule the world our own way, but in our sin, the world is constantly in conflict. Our lives are a constant struggle and there is no true peace. We pray that you give us wisdom to use the time we have well, bringing the message of eternal hope through sharing the gospel. May we not hold on to the security of worldly possessions, but help us to seek your kingdom first. Lord, we thank you for the gospel training that Moore College does. We thank you for the students you have raised up over the years and sent out into the harvest field. We pray for the current students who have taken part in missions this week. We pray for the students that they have learnt from the experience so that they can continue to share the gospel in the future. We also pray for the work they have done this week, for the seeds sown, for the gospel shared, that you would grow your church in every place, in every nation. Lord, we ask for your wisdom and grace for our church here. As the leaders plan for the year ahead, may your spirit guide them in the decisions they make. We thank you for all the gifts and talents you have given us, for the many ministries running from week to week. Help us to serve one another and build each other up to be a people that honours your name and shares the gospel with our neighbours. Lastly, we ask that you help us to bear each other's burdens, to lift up those who are weary. May we help each other to run the race set out before us with perseverance. We entrust these things and the unspoken needs that are in our hearts to you, knowing that your will is good and perfect. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's remind each other of God's grace given to us through Jesus Christ. Please stand.
the announcements, uh, quite a few of them this week there. Um, the first one on the list there is just drawing your attention to uh, EQUIP uh, 2024, the Women's Conference, on Saturday the 22nd of June. Uh, there's also a preschool picnic on Sunday the 21st, uh, just to RSVP to Cindy. Uh, RSVP today to Cindy, if you can. Uh, there's also a couple of um, uh, uh, training there today after the service is for congregational prayer. Uh, the welcome training is on 5th of May. Also between the, uh, the 19th and 21st of April there, uh, a few of the people from uh, both kids and um, leaders from youth group there will be going to KYCK conference up in Katoomba. Uh, and also there's a marriage course starting on the 7th of May. And also, please see Joe if you're interested in um, helping out in the kids' club in the July school holidays. I think it's the 18th and 19th of July. So that's the, all the announcements there. But uh, a reminder that um, we serve a God who is holy, righteous, and just. He will come in judgment. He will judge all sin. But as David said there, that Jesus has already seen the day of the Lord. He's actually taken the punishment of sin so that we can share in the blessing uh, that, that he receives. God's loving, as we sung, he's gracious and he's compassionate. So he gives us a, a, a way to make peace with him, to reconcile, but it requires repentance. Repeating the, the words of Joel chapter 2, the day of the Lord is great, it is dreadful, who can endure it? Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, it is right to praise you for who you are, the creator of the universe and in it, everything in it. Help us to see your anger, your righteous anger, in how sin has taken over the world. Lord, you are angry with sin, but you are compassionate. You weep with us who mourn. You don't just get us, but you save us. Lord, help us to realize our sin, our lives lived apart from you, in rebellion to you and ignoring you. Help us to repent and turn back towards you that we may share the inheritance of Jesus and what he has done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join us for morning tea and as David alluded to, join us next week for the, um, what we have the prelude to this week there. Next week, the day of the Lord.